Good afternoon and welcome to part three of the CIM New Brunswick branch virtual event series on an emerging gold district in southwestern New Brunswick. Today we will be discussing tectonic evolution of terrains in southwestern New Brunswick, regional correlations, and getting the most out of airborne magnetic data, interpretation techniques, and reprocessing historic data using machine learning. My name is Holly Stewart, and I will be your moderator today. Thank you for joining us. If you joined with computer audio, make sure you selected the computer audio button on your control panel. The meeting duration will be approximately one hour. Each speaker will present for approximately 20 minutes, followed by a five minute Q&A. Once both speakers have presented, there will be an opportunity to continue discussions at the end for those who wish to remain in the meeting. Attendees will be muted during the presentations. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in the control panel. The questions will be addressed at the end of each presentation. You may also use the raise hand function to be unmuted to ask your question. Follow up contact links will be provided at the end of each speaker's presentation. We are pleased to inform you that the presentations will be recorded and available soon. Our first speaker today is Susan Johnson. Susan is from the Department of Natural Resources and Energy Development and will be presenting on tectonic evolution of terrains in southwestern New Brunswick regional correlations. Welcome, Susan. Thanks. How's that? Can you move it? Can we all see it? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, as Holly said, my talk this morning is on the tectonic evolution of southwestern New Brunswick, uh, regional correlations, and hopefully some insights into the mineral potential. Uh, before I start, I just want to say that um, most of the information in this slide, it, most of the information and the diagrams in this presentation are compiled from uh, several sources, uh, the major ones shown here. So I'll be giving a brief uh, overview of the Appalachians as a whole, and then I'll uh, talk about the lithotectonic belts and uh, their relationship to the tectonic evolution of southwestern New Brunswick, and then go into some correlations and mineral potential. So the Appalachian origin is a classic example of a very long-lived accretionary origin, spanning almost 200 million years from late Cambrian to early Permian time. And it involved the sequential accretion of oceanic and continental trains to one another, and eventually to the Laurentian margin by closure of the Iapetus and Rhaic oceans. And accretionary origins are, are therefore the sites of long-lived convergent margin tectonics, both compressional and extensional. And they're also a uh, host of the majority of the world's important gold deposits. Um, accretionary origins typically contain a very diverse range of deposit types, uh, commonly uh, close, very uh, close in, excuse me, commonly in close proximity, both in space and time. Uh, this slide just shows the simplified <clears throat> map of the Appalachians after Hibbert et al. And they break down the Appalachians into the three fundamental uh, divisions, the Laurentian realm, Iapetan realm, and Perigondwanan realm. Uh, the Laurentian realm uh, includes the rocks of the Laurentian margin and basement inliers. The Iapetan realm, uh, in the Southern Appalachians uh, is uh, comprised of the Piedmont and Goochland terrains. And in the Northern Appalachians, it's part of the Dunnage zone, which they further divide into the Peri Laurentian or Notre Dame subzone. So that's the active margin of Laurentia here on this late uh, Cambrian paleo reconstruction. And then they uh, have the Peri Gondwanan exploit subzone, which are the active margin of Gondwana here. And then in the Perigondwanan realm, we have Gandaria, Avalonia, Maguma, and Carolinia. And <clears throat> these represent these microcontinental fragments here uh, that rifted off of different parts of Gondwana. 
and traveled across Iapetus, uh, accreting to the Laurentian margin uh, during several events. These uh, main orogenic events of the Appalachian are the late Cambrian Ordovician Taconic orogeny and Penobscot orogeny that were happening on both sides uh, or opposite margins of Iapetus, Taconic uh, around Laurentia and the Penobscot uh, uh, around the Gondwanan margin, specifically uh, subduction beneath Gandaria. Uh, the late Ordovician to late Silurian Salinic orogeny um, was a protracted event. Uh, and was all events uh, leading to the accretion of the leading edge of Gandaria to Laurentia. The late Silurian early Devonian Acadian orogeny uh, related to the accretion of Avalonia uh, to Gandaria. And this was the last major mountain building event in the Northern Appalachians. Uh, most of the Northern Appalachians were only mildly or, or unaffected by the um, subsequent Neo-Acadian and Alleghenian orogenies. However, Southern New Brunswick um, underwent major strike slip tectonism and episodes of thrusting during the, the Middle Devonian Neo-Acadian uh, related to the docking of Maguma. And also during the Permian Alleghenian, uh, uh, the final assembly of Pangaea. Uh, and they had, um, quite uh, profound effects on the reconfiguration of the terrains in Southern New Brunswick as Adrian had, had spoken of in his talk. So uh, now we'll go into the lithotectonic terrains and cover sequences and how they relate to the tectonic evolution. <clears throat> Excuse me, the oldest rocks in New Brunswick are Neoproterozoic and older basement terrains here found in Southern New Brunswick. And these are part of these Perigondwan and microcontinents I spoke about. And in, uh, they include the Caledonia terrain shown here in red, the Brookville terrain in blue, and the New River terrain in the purple colors. The Caledonia terrain is the only one that is considered to be part of Avalonia. Um, prior to the, the mid-1990s, all of these Neoproterozoic rocks were considered to be part of the Avalon terrain. However, um, subsequently, all kinds of different um, uh, studies going on with, uh, in stratigraphy, uh, the uh, magmatism, the isotopic character of these Brookville and New River terrains were found to be slightly different than those in Avalonia. So they have since then been considered to represent Gander Basement. Uh, therefore, the Caledonia terrain is the only one considered to be correlative with the Avalon zone in Newfoundland. And I think it's safe to say that it's not that clear, but I'll elaborate a bit more on that later. Uh, Lake Cambrian and Ordovician terrains of the Gander Exploit subzone here in southern New Brunswick are the St. Croix terrain shown in gray, uh, considered to be some of the Gander margin uh, sequence deposited on the basin, and the Annadale terrain here considered volcanic and associated sedimentary rocks uh, thought to have formed in the Penobscot. Lurian belts uh, in southwestern New Brunswick consist of the Kingston, uh, Mascarene, and Fredericton belts. Kingston here shown in the orange, Mascarene in the greens here, and the Fredericton belt in the blue. Uh, the Kingston and Mascarene belts played a big part in the Acadian orogeny. As the early Silurian arc volcanics and granitoids of the Kingston and the volcanic and sedimentary rocks of the Mascarene are considered <clears throat> to uh, represent the arc and back arc related to subduction of the Acadian Seaway uh, during the convergence of Avalonia and the trailing margin of Gandaria. Uh, there are no remains of the Acadian Seaway uh, that we know of here in South, uh, South New Brunswick. However, evidence to support um, this interpretation is the Pokologan metamorphic suite here shown in this little green uh, sliver here. And it, um, it is a sliver of high pressure, low temperature metamorphic rocks that are interpreted uh, to represent the accretionary wedge outboard of the Kingston Arc. Um, in contrast, the Fredericton belt uh, in the, the Frederick Kingston and the Fredericton trough consists of Silurian turbidites that are interpreted uh, to be four deep sediments deposited on the passive margin of the Tadabush Exploits back arc basin. Uh, related to tectonic loading during the Salinic orogeny. 
Um, this diagram from Van Sol and Burr uh, is just a depiction of, of um, an interpretation of what the Laurentian merge in here looked like in the early Silurian. And it shows the position of where we think the Pogolubin metamorphic suite uh, occurred, the coastal arc, which is the same as the Kingston arc, Ascarine uh, back arc basin, and here um, where they, they interpret the Fredericton trough to so as you can see, while the leading edge of Gandaria here was colliding with composite Laurentia during the main phase of the Salinic orogeny in Wenlock time, the Kingston arc and Mascarene back arc were well established on the trailing edge of Gandaria. And there are structural fossil and geochronological evidence that indicates that there was a period of uplift, uplift and erosion in the Mascarene back arc basin sometime around the Wenlock Ludlow boundary. Um, possibly signaling uh, the arrival of Adelonia at the uh, Laurentian margin. So these uh, four arc sediments and early Silurian granitoid rocks here in the Pogolovin metamorphic suite, uh, worked by uh, Masson et al. and White et al. have shown that these were metamorphosed uh, by burial to mid to lower crustal levels in the early Devonian around 417. So um, possibly what we think would be the peak of the Acadian orogeny, uh, much older than was originally thought. Uh, these rocks were metamorphosed again around 388 in the middle Devonian. And this uh, was likely due to uh, transcurrent uh, tectonic activity related to the dextral uh, strike slip docking of the Maguma terrain uh, during the Neo-Acadian orogeny. So after closure of the mass green back arc basin, the composite St. George were emplaced into the back arc area in three distinct pulses that covered a span, a time span of almost 60 million years. And recent work by Mohammedi et al. Um, on her PhD thesis, they relate uh, this to the protracted uh, tectonomagmatic evolution of the St. George Batholith to the collision of Avalonia with composite Laurentia during the Acadian orogeny. And they divide the batholith into three main groups, the late Silurian, early Devonian bimodal A-types, these uh, darker red ones, early to middle Devonian INS-type plutons in the oranges, and late Devonian uh, fractionated I-types uh, in the, the light uh, pinks. Um, this diagram just shows all of the plutons in southwestern New Brunswick going um, from northwest on the left side to southeast on the right and on the bottom, it, uh, it shows which of the Silurian belts these intrude and their interpreted uh, basement here. I just wanted to bring this up because um, Mohammedi et al. research demonstrated that there are spatial and temporal changes in the trace and rare earth element chemistry and the isotopic signature of these plutons as you go from Southeast to Northwest. And this was similar to changes documented by Whalen across a major suture in central Newfoundland. So they attribute these changes uh, to slab breakoff, uh, resulting in a change from the shallow melting of juvenile crust proximal to the suture uh, uh, to deeper levels uh, melting of the older granitic basement further to the west. So I just want to say before we go any further, go any further. Um, I would just want to talk a bit about the Avalon Gander boundary in southern New Brunswick and the Acadian suture. Um, in Newfoundland, the Avalon Gander boundary is the Dover Fault, and this fault is commonly equated with the Caledonia Fault here, separating the Avalonian Caledonia terrain from the Gandaria Brookville terrain. However, in Newfoundland, there's none of this pesky Brookville and Kingston and all this to deal with because they are Avalonian terrain is uh, juxtaposed along the Dover Fault against rocks of the Gander exploit zone, such as these. So if Kingston and Mascarene um, the, are related to Avalonia Gandaria convergence, the position of the Brookville terrain is problematic for a couple of reasons. It lies outboard of the Kingston Arc and accretionary wedge of the Pocologan Metamorphic Suite. And it also contains no evidence of Silurian magmatism, which would be expected if it was on the upper plate here. And also there's, um, you know, classic Avalonian cover rocks in the eastern part of the New River terrain, uh, uh, which are also troublesome. 
I mean, a couple of different scenarios have been proposed to explain this, including transfer of these terrains back and forth during maybe during the early Ordovician Penobscot orogeny, or other scenarios uh, have been proposed where uh, several of these belts have been shuffled along the Belle Isle kind of the cases faults uh, in Carboniferous time or, or even later. Um, I, I think that a combination of these two makes the most sense to me. Um, and that this exotic Brookville terrain could have been attached uh, to Caledonia well before it accreted uh, to the composite Laurentian margin. And in this scenario, the Acadian suture um, and the Acadian seaway would have been west of the Brookville terrain. And uh, this would be consistent with uh, Waldron's Acadian line. Uh, this, uh, And also, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Selenic Suture or Dog Bay Line. The Dog Bay Line is the location where the Tetherbridge Exploits Basin finally closed. It's traditionally placed here at the Bamford Brook Fault. However, recent studies by Doc and et al. indicate the provenance of the early Silurian sediments across the Fredericton Fault are, are very different. Early Silurian detritus in the Hayes Brook north of the fault have Laurentian sources where the rocks of the same age south of the fault, the Dig de Gouache Formation, have Gondwanan sources. Uh, and the appearance of Laurentian detritus in rocks south of the Fredericton Fault didn't happen until uh, around 4.30, uh, the time of closure of, uh, of the Tetagush Export Spackard Basin during the main phase of the Selenic. So this suggests that the Fredericton Fault may actually uh, mark the location of the Selenic suture and uh, the probable existence here in southern New Brunswick of two major uh, crustal structures uh, is uh, bodes well for the gold potential in here. So now I'll get on to some correlations and mineral potential. Um, excuse me, these, these diagrams are all taken from Van Stahl and Bar 212. And the type area of Avalon uh, is, like I said, correlated with the Caledonia terrain. Uh, rocks in the Anaganish and Cabocud Highlands in mainland Nova Scotia, the Myra terrain of, of uh, Brookville terrain um, is, has, there's some very firm correlations that have been, a, be, been made between the Brookville terrain and the Bordeaux terrain in Cape Breton Island, um, containing some, some very similar uh, sequences. Hermitage flexure, there are Nisic rocks in here that possibly uh, uh, may be correlative. Um, the New River terrain um, has, we don't know for sure, the certain uh, correlations aren't that certain, but there are neoproterozoic rocks in the Aspie terrain and in the Hermitage flexure that possibly are correlatives. Uh, the St. John, the uh, St. Croix, excuse me, and Annadale terrains are essentially um, a part of these Penobscot arc rocks and the gander sedimentary rocks. So all of the rocks in the dark green and yellow here, the Northern Appalachians are potential correlatives. Uh, the Penobscot and Ellsworth terrains in Maine have been correlated uh, with the Annadale terrain. And there are early Ordovician arc plutons in the Aspie terrain that may also possibly uh, be related to Penobscot um, uh, volcanism. And in the exploits, uh, zone, excuse me, in central Newfoundland, uh, these rocks are, are occur widely uh, throughout this area. And the, the lower part of the exploits, which is the Penobscotian uh, uh, volcanics, occur in the uh, lower part of the Victoria Lake group in the western exploit zone. They occur in the Bay de Nord group in the southern exploits. And they also occur um, associated with some of the Ophiolitic uh, Lake Cambrian Ophiolites uh, along the Grub Line, uh, near Koi Pond and Pipestone Pond uh, in the central and uh, northeastern parts of the exploits, Gander exploits. I mean, it's difficult to say with certainty what exactly correlates with Annadale and St. Croix, but uh, it, it has been suggested that the Annadale Belt may equate with the uh, Gander River Ultra Basic uh, Belt and associated volcanic rocks here. Uh, Kingston Mast Green, uh, 
directly on strike with the coastal arc in Maine. I think that firm correlation is pretty firm. There's also some late Ordovician and Silurian arc plutons in the Aspie terrain uh, and uh, possibly the La Poile group in Newfoundland, which the uh, Mascarene group has. Moving on to the Fredericton Belt, uh, the Kingsclear group um, is correlated with the Indian Islands group here, just southeast of the Dog Bay Line uh, in Newfoundland. So now we'll get on to some uh, correlations and gold potentials. This slide shows the Nova Scotia Geological Survey's handout showing gold opportunities in, in Nova Scotia uh, from 2020. Uh, we have no Maguma terrain, uh, so unfortunately, none of this great Maguma gold here. Uh, but as you recall, there's been a pretty firm link uh, between the Bredore terrain here and the Brookville terrain in, south in southern New Brunswick. So the Bredore terrain hosts several gold occurrences, uh, including the Highland, uh, Highland Gold Project, a significant uh, vein deposit associated with the Eastern Highland Shear Zone in here, which is a major myelinetic high strain zone lying between the Bredore and Aspie terrains. And as you may recall, the Aspie terrain does contain late Ordovician and early Silurian arc granitoids that possibly are related to those in the Kingston terrain. So this suggests that the uh, uh, Eastern Highland Shear Zone here uh, may lie in a similar position to the Pogolobin Metamorphic Suite uh, in Southern New Brunswick as uh, Nicholas talked about in, in talks previously here. Um, and this suggests that this area of Southern New Brunswick uh, may have si significant uh, gold potential as well. Um, moving on to Newfoundland, as you all know, Newfoundland is home to many significant gold deposits, uh, both uh, producers, past producers, and uh, many with re resource estimates. Um, in the Hermitage Flexure area here, the Neoproterozoic hosted high sulfidation epithermal gold like that at Hope Brook. Um, we don't know exactly what it's correlative with because there's still a lot of controversy as to what these rocks actually are. Um, lots of people put them in Avalon, lots of people put them in Gander, so it's, it's really hard to say what this is equivalent to in New Brunswick. However, I think the most interesting area here is the Gander Gold Belt that occurs between the Dog Bay Line here and the Grub Line. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's host uh, to many significant orogenic gold deposits, including uh, Newfound Gold's uh, Queensway project and intrusion related gold here at the Huckster Lane uh, Mosquito Hill occurrence. So I think there's some interesting parallels that can be drawn between the Gander Gold Belt and southwestern New Brunswick, as they both occur in close proximity to the Dog Bay Line. And both are underlain by Cambrian and Ordovician rocks of the Gander exploit subzone and overlying Silurian rocks, including the Indian Islands group, as you recall, that's been correlated with the Kingsclear group here in New Brunswick. And um, I, obviously everyone knows this area already has significant potential for gold, including uh, numerous occurrences of mainly orogenic type gold in Annadale. And in the Clarence Stream area, uh, as far as we know, mostly intrusion related gold that's uh, that occurs here, uh, linked to the lower Devonian uh, granitoid plutons. Um, rocks of this age are lacking in the Annadale terrain, so that may explain some of the differences uh, in the types of gold deposits. But as I mentioned in one of the first slides, accretionary origins tend to have uh, you know, a wide variety of deposit types. Another interesting parallel between these two areas is the presence of major anemone deposits, the former Lake George anemone mine here, and this blue star here, which is the Beaverbrook anemone uh, deposit in Newfoundland, both associated uh, with early uh, Devonian pluton. So to wrap things up, I just wanna say that the presence of these two major crustal structures, possibly the Acadian suture and the Salinic suture here in Southwestern New Brunswick, makes it a very favorable area for gold expo exploration. And just the sheer number of gold occurrences here in Newfoundland in an area that's received significantly less attention than the Valentine Lake Belt here to the west uh, speaks to the potential uh, uh, for additional gold and anemone deposits in southwestern New Brunswick, uh, much of which uh, hasn't seen a whole lot of exploration.
Thank you, Sue. Great presentation. Uh, now we're ready for the Q&A. And a reminder that you can either raise your hand to ask a question or type in the chat. Oh. So was the sound breaking up during the presentation? I see uh, there was a comment on that. I didn't see that until now. It, just a little bit here and there, but uh, oh, okay. there was no context left. There was just a, a word or two here and there. Okay. Okay, so if there's no questions at this time, we'll move on to our next speaker. Reminder that you will be able to ask questions at the end. Okay, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Simon Craigs. Simon is a senior consultant in the Structural Geology Group with SRK Consulting. Welcome, Simon. Uh, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. This is weird. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Uh, after all that practice. Um, sorry. Uh, here we go. Sorry, one second. Okay, can you see my screen now? Great, thank you. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Uh, okay, yeah, so um, uh, I'm Simon Craggs. Uh, I'm a senior consultant in the Structural Geology Group with SRK Consulting. And today I'm going to give a short talk uh, just about getting the most value uh, out of uh, Aeromag, Airborne Magnetic uh, data. Uh, so, um, so the industry focus is on efficient targeting, uh, resource definition and exploitation of deposits. Um, and the key factor in that is understanding how to best utilize geological, geophysical and geochemical data sets um, uh, to ensure the efficient, accurate target evaluation. Um, in general, our industry is still not maximizing the benefits that we can get from these all these disciplines. Um, in, I've worked for SRK for uh, almost 10 years now, um, and um, just in preparation for this talk, I decided to just have a look at uh, where I've worked in the world. Um, and, you, know, you can see mostly it's uh, North America, but also some South America, West Africa, uh, and other places as well. Um, and you know, to see how many of those projects uh, interpretation of magnetic data have been a key component of. Um, it turns out it's about 60% um, of, uh, of the projects I've worked on. That's been a major thing. Now, one of the first things I will uh, always ask a client uh, is, do you have mag data? And the answer is often yes. The second question I'll ask is, well, have you interpreted it? And the answer is often either no or eh, in part, we picked out a few big structures here and there. And so uh, this always seems strange to me because you know, doing an interpretation on mag data, uh, it can be extremely valuable. Um, and the, uh, for the whole process of doing the mag interpretation, the most expensive part of that is acquiring the data. And so I, I always find it strange that people will acquire the data, but then not use it to its full value. So what I want to talk about today is a little bit of how we can get that value out of that data. So you know, most regional interpretations are based on aeromagnetic data, and they're used in conjunction with other geophysical data sets like radiometric, gravity, uh, electromagnetic or seismic. Um, or maybe some multispectral and hyperspectral surveys. But the question is, why is Aeromag so, so useful and so much more useful than those other uh, 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 geophysical data sets? Well, um, Aeromag is the fundamental data set used for the structural interpretation. Uh, it displays a wider range of geological attributes than radiometric, 
uh, gravity and electromag. Uh, it's applicable at all scales from continental down to mine scale. And you can often, you know, government agencies often fly it. So you can often get the data at little to no cost. Uh, it's simpler and more effective. Um, it's simpler in application, more effective than some of the other methods. Uh, the magnetic mineral content can be uh, sensed to you know, excellent resolution at good depths. Um, it can provide crucial geological input into all types of terrains, including sedimentary basins. Um, you can do direct detection of uh, iron oxide or sulfide systems. And as I said before, there are uh, broader applications for delineating structure, stratigraphy, and alteration. So, the uses of aeromagnetic data. What can we get out of it? Or well, we can get out. We can get the lithology out of it. We can get structure, alteration, metamorphism, mineralization. I'm not going to talk about all these things. So I don't really have the time today. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, getting the structural data out of it. A little bit uh, talking a little bit about lithology as well. Uh, we can do this because you know magnetic minerals are present in almost all rock types. We can measure very, very small variations in magnetic signals. And the airborne surveys allow rapid and especially now inexpensive coverage, especially now with, uh, with the advent of uh, drone surveys, which have really reduced the cost. Um, and we can use the AeroMag in all sorts of uh, all sorts of areas, whether they're poorly exposed to try and get information between outcrops in covered areas or even in well exposed areas where we may not see, say, like, you know, deeper structures, uh, they, they may not come to surface in some areas. So, uh, so what's the problem? Um, well, the problem is that uh, when people typically when uh, MAG data is interpreted, there's a lack of geological reality or knowledge involved in the interpretations. People will commonly just draw lines on a map. Um, they will not show cross-cutting relationships. They will not show kinematics. There'll be no indication of relative timing and no indication of where broader fault zones or damage zones are. The three images you've got on the, uh, on the right here, uh, you can see, you know, there's lots of lines drawn on these, uh, but they don't really give us any information. There's certainly no information about the relative timing of the structures um, and uh, or their or their kinematics. Um, so you know it's it's very difficult, if not impossible, to relate mineralization. You know whether we get it, uh, say from um, soil geochemical surveys or underground or anything like, or uh, prospecting. It's very difficult to relate those lines that have been drawn to the mineralization. It's like which one, which one's the correct one to be looking at, basically. So, um, what can we get out of the data? Well, uh, distribution of structures, so faults and faults, lithologies. We can do so get some alteration uh, in, information as well. Kinematics, certainly, relative timing, uh, we can definitely get that out of the data. Um, the development of tectonic models, uh, predictive targeting. A lot of the work I do is uh, I, I will do the uh, interpretation of the data, and then I will hand my interpretation off to my colleague, who is a machine learning expert, and he will use it as a fundamental part of his uh, prospectivity analyses. Um, and we can also um, uh, extend our models outside of the immediate area to different uh, areas or terrains. So the key questions that we need to be asking ourselves when we're doing a MAG interpretation are what structures occur, uh, what stru what's their extent, their geometry, uh, what was the strain produced and under what pressure temperature conditions, what's their 3D geometry. We should always be thinking in 3D when we do this. There is a tendency when we're looking, when we're doing an interpretation to be thinking in 2D. Uh, so you know, everything really, when you're working in 2D, uh, 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 you know, looking down on, on the data, everything looks like it strikes slip, but it might not be. Um, what was the tectonic uh, driving force? And most importantly, what is the relationship of all that to the mineralization? So important observations to make. So you know we can use map, uh, we can do structural traces from geophysics or field data or maps. 3D fault dips, 
this will generally come from field data, though we can get it from magnetic profiles, um, fault displacement vectors, so either relative displacement or kinematic indicators or associated structures, the timings of structures, so you know, fault intersections, which falls is offsetting which, displacement of marker units, or if we've got absolute dating, we can use that as well, and what the fault characteristics look like. So, you know, are they thin and straight, or are they shallow and brittle, or are they broad, discrete breaks, or, or are they ductile, broad zones with no breaks? Uh, in addition, we can look at, you know, other associated features. So we can look at folds, what's their shape, what's their orientation. Uh, second order sediments and basins, any associated intrusives or extrusives, bending and alteration, recognition of fault hierarchy is really important and we can get that from the data. Um, it's, I will talk about this a little bit more later on, but recognition of fault hierarchy is important because you know, first order structures aren't necessarily the best ones uh, for your sites of big mineralization. They'll often be good fluid conduits, but not Good fluid sinks. So we really want to be looking at the second, third order structures for those. Uh, strain variations uh, inferred from block geometries um, and what the regional context is. And also, um, can we see any evidence for uh, reactivation of pre-existing structures? So um, the rest of the talk is really going to be mostly about how we actually do the interpretation. Um, I do a lot of, I do all my interpretation generally in ArcGIS. A lot of this can be applied to QGIS, certainly. To some extent, MapInfo. I'm not a huge fan of MapInfo, but uh, a lot of this can be done in there as well. Uh, so the methodology um, closely follows the methodology for mapping with aerial photos. Uh, a big thing is that prior to doing the interpretation, we want to read as much as we can, digest as much uh, information from previous geological interpretations. Um, so we can understand the tectonic setting and structural style and understand what we would expect to find. But the really important thing is to allow for an informed interpretation and that the interpretation that we're doing on the mag is not biased by the previous interpretations. Um, you know, the, the mag data should add to the structural understanding. Right? So we don't want to try and force it into um, a previous framework that not, isn't necessarily entirely correct. And finally, always field test the interpretation. Um, I would never recommend setting up a drill program directly from a mag interpretation. Uh, there's two, the, the, the resolution is not great enough. Uh, it should just give us ideas of where to go and look in more detail. So uh, there are various stages to uh, MAG interpretation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these. Uh, I will talk about four line construction. Um, this is basically where we define the, the grain of the lithotectonic stratigraphy or foliation. It, this is a very important first step that we need to do. Um, identification of magnetic rock units, that kind of comes into the lithology uh, definition of domains. I will certainly talk about uh, definition of structural elements, so faults and folds and shear zones. Uh, lithological distribution, so how can we identify units and sequences? Um, and then finally putting all that into one coherent structural framework. So uh, form line mapping. This is the first stage. Um, it's probably the simplest thing to do in the entire interpretation, but I would suggest that it's probably the most important. Uh, effectively, what we're doing is we're just drawing little lines on every uh, mag high that we see. And what it does is it then represents the lithotectonic stratigraphy. Um, so we can define the geometry of bedding or foliation within domains. We can also define the internal fabric of, uh, of plutons as well. Um, and it's critical in defining uh, domain boundaries and shear zone uh, fault locations and discontinuity. So the basically discontinuities between form lines uh, highlight where structures are. Uh, the image that you're seeing uh, on the on the right there is from Kino Hill. Um, a lot of the interpretations I've done I can't show obviously because they're proprietary. This is from my uh, PhD thesis work which is still ongoing. Um, and 
basically what we're uh, what it's showing is that you've got the overall tectonic grain showing what appears to be um, a, a lazy S-shaped uh, pull apart pull releasing bend. Uh, field studies uh, show that we've got a lot of uh, left lateral movement in there, so this would be a releasing bend on there. And so that gives us some key information about um, what the controls on mineralization uh, could be in that area. Okay, so moving on to the structural elements. So oh yeah, identi uh, using the form lines, we can identify the changes and disruptions in the domains um, with uh, kind of, uh, that help define, define the uh, timing of the geological events. So this phase includes defining faults and shear zones or fault generations and geometry. So um, on the bottom left here, you've got a, an image from uh, the Mount Isa Inlay in Queensland. You can see you've got a lot of particularly uh, northeast trending, fairly linear uh, structures going across that are um, uh, normal faults, late normal faults. On the right, you've got a, an example of a few really quite beautiful fault closures from the Glenny domain in, uh, in Saskatchewan. So in um, interpreting faults from the mag and shear zones from the magnetic data, we can do that by looking for offsets of older magnetic units. Um, the faults themselves will commonly have uh, very, like, uh, uh, they'll commonly be a mag low, they won't exclusively be a mag low. Um, we can uh, identify them by the juxtap juxtaposition of subdomains um, or differing form line orientation. Uh, the presence of demagnetized, uh, demagnetization cutting magnetic rocks. Occasionally, it's pretty rare, but occasionally you can get it for, you can identify them from zones of enhanced magnetization. Um, you can get them from abrupt uh, change in the frequency uh, of magnetic anomalies, um, or occasionally we can do it from quantitative profile analysis, that's something I very rarely do. Uh, but we can also differentiate between the style of fault, so brittle, brittle ductile and ductile. Um, ductile structures will typically be broad zones of anastomosing structures, they'll be curvy linear. Um, you know, we can see them from the, the bending of the magnetic layering uh, or contacts into the shear zone. Um, the alteration may be additive or destructive. Um, and uh, we also get uh, offset of units commonly associated with deflection or thinning of the magnetic anomaly as they, as they uh, approach the shear zone. Riddle features tend to be more linear um, with more angular margins to internal fault box, uh, angular fault jogs or steps, um, although uh, high level brittle basin faults uh, can commonly also show curvy linear trends. Um, the magnetic uh, mineral alteration tends to be destructive um, because you're basically destroying magnetite as you develop the faults uh, and you get offset of units uh, typically you know you get these abrupt breaks so uh, when we're doing the interpretation this is back to the Kino Hill uh, data in the Yukon once we once we've done the interpretation we can some people like to uh, draw all the faults on first and then try and define the age and then the order subsequently to that of the various structures. I don't like doing that. I like to try and define age and order as I'm going through. Um, but understanding the age, the, the age uh, and order of structures uh, and how they relate to your mineralization is really, really important. Here at the Kino Hill uh, area, we basically have three uh, generations of fault or shear zone. Uh, we have D1, which is um, low angle uh, thrust faulting. They're identified by the black structures. Um, they're pretty underrepresented in this mag data. Part of the reason for that is that um, you have a pretty, the, the, the structures are very low angle. So the angle of incidence between the magnetometer and the structure uh, is quite quite narrow, which tends to disperse the um, 
the magnetic anomaly, I guess. Um, so they can be very difficult to, to identify. Structures that are more upright are a lot easier to identify. Uh, then we have D2. D2 is associated with mineralization in this. So uh, you know, uh, understanding where those structures are um, and how big they are is important. And then we have late post mineralizing uh, mineralization structures that offset everything. Um, okay. So, but then we can get on, once we've done that, you know, we, we have the broad structural framework, um, but we can really dive into the data and start pulling things out of the data to help us refine our targets. Um, and we can use assumptions made from the structural interpretations uh, or information from like, real data field studies. You know, we can use that to refine the targets. So, you know, what are the structures, what structures associated with mineralization? In this case, it's D2. So where are they? Okay, so then we can do a density distribution on them as I've done down here. You can also do a density distribution on um, fault intersections as well, uh, if that's the important driving factor in the mineralization. Um, and then once we've done that, we can then start considering what other variables uh, uh, might there be. So, you know, in this area here, we have uh, you know, a large number of D2 faults, but you know, they're actually they're in um, schistose rocks, which aren't particularly uh, conducive to the mineralization in this area. Whereas you know, sitting out here or out here, we tend to be in more uh, quartzitic rocks, which are a lot more brittle and they're uh, a much better host for the mineralization. So we can say, well, we should be going out here and we should be poking around here to to see if there's uh, uh, any significant mineralization. Uh, further than that, you know, if we know that mineralization is associated with specific fault orientations, so in, in Kino Hill, we know uh, very, very clearly that what you have is you have a set of um, east-northeast trending structures that are quite large, but don't really host particularly good mineralization the mineralization is associated with the second and third order structures, which are splays off, and they tend to orient themselves more northeast-ish. Um, so, you know, uh, we can uh, do a fault segment orientation analysis on this. You can do this just straight from the, from the, um, uh, from the, the lines that you've created. The problem is if you've got curvy linear lines and you're using arc, when you're calculating the orientation of the structure, it'll just take the, the midpoint. And if it's a curvy linear line, it's not going to give you a true representation of that data. So what I like to do is I like to split the lines by vertices, make sure all the full azimuths are in the same hemisphere, and then color them by, uh, by orientation so that we can then say, OK, in, in this picture up here, OK, where we've got blue, greeny color uh, structures, these are the more preferential orientation for uh, for mineralization. You know, using this, if we know the overall, uh, the, uh, the regional stress regime at the time, we can also predict um, the kinematics on those structures. You know, so we can say that the, the structures that are going east northeast are mostly going to be strike slip structures, whereas as we come round to northeast, then we're getting into extension uh, and, and more normal movement on those structures. So those structures are opening up and, and uh, giving us. Uh, a better chance of mineralization and that can so that can help us predict the mineral plunge on those and it can also help us design uh, drill programs better to target those things. Okay so then we get on to once we've done the full interpretation we can do a lithological distribution. So sorry I didn't quite catch that. Oh, Could you please repeat? Sorry that was Siri. Um, so uh, what we can to do this, we use existing geological data. So you know, we need uh, boots on the ground, identifying rocks on the ground. To do the interpretation, we would use the uh, total field or residual field data uh, to build up a pseudo magnetic stratigraphy like we got over on the left here. Uh, and basically what we're doing there is we're identifying where we've got a known value in the field and then zooming in on either Geosoft or ER Mapper and finding what the nano Tesla value for that is, and then building up the pseudo magnetic stratigraphy. 
but then we use the first vertical derivative data to, to actually define the boundaries. Um, but you know, often there'll be a lot of overlap. You can see there's quite a lot of overlap here. Um, so then we start using magnetic texture. So is it mottled or is it just a flat texture or something like that to subdivide those units? Uh, and then once we've done all that, the, the final thing is integrating everything together into one geological, uh, geophysical interpretation of the area. Um, and so you compile the domains, the fold and fault layers, and the lithology uh, into one coherent package. Um, so some of the, you know, some of the more interpretive structures that weren't obvious in the mag data may start to may start to come out. Okay. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about uh, one new big advance um, that's just that's just coming through. Um, this is something that's been or being developed by a company called Geolearn in um, in Quebec. Uh, and they're using uh, machine learning to reprocess uh, historic magnetic data. And I think this is this could potentially be a huge uh, step forward. Um, so they, uh, what they do is they use something called the generative adversarial uh, networks uh, analysis. Effectively, it's, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen deep fakes uh, on the internet, but it's the same sort of um, algorithm uh, as those. And so what, what it is, is that the uh, older historic coarser data um, are trained, those, those, the, they're put into the generator and the models are trained using combination of that and smaller areas of high resolution data. Um, and so the, uh, the algorithm effectively, um, it, it doesn't see the high resolution data, it generates new samples, and then it learns how similar that is to the real data. Uh, and then we it's validated against some areas that are co-located that are kept completely hidden from the result. You can see some of their um, uh, some of their tests work down here where we have the low resolution data, we have some high resolution data, and this is uh, this is the end result. Uh, so you know you can see that if if we only had this uh, this high resolution data, they didn't use all of it to to drive this interpretation. They just used a few co-located packages, and it produced this, uh, which is you know, a much better product than just the low resolution data that we had initially. Uh, so I think this is you know, potentially gonna be a huge step forward uh, for us uh, being able to one, do mag or uh, upscale uh, old data cheaply uh, and get a lot more uh, information out of that old data. Uh, I've got a question at the bottom here about what about um, AI fault interpretations. Um, the answer for that is not yet. Uh, I've seen some interpret some uh, fault interpretations using machine learning. Uh, at the moment, they're not good, uh, which is good for me because it keeps me in a job. Uh, but um, I don't doubt that you know progress will be made on that. Um, over the next probably 10 years or so. Um, regardless though, they will still, those full interpretations will still need a, a geologist with an informed eye to do an interpretation to help train the, uh, the algorithms. Uh, so in conclusion, um, so to produce an accurate uh, applied geological interpretation, think geologically, what are the processes and controls um, when defining the geological er uh, elements, incorporate reality, um, define your uh, geological and structural history, and incorporate as many data sets as you can into that. Focus on inter uh, interpretation from the start with an understanding on the potential controls on the distribution of mineralization. So look for areas of complexity, uh, so fault bends, step overs, jogs, relays termination zones, what are the preferred host rocks, where are the competency contrasts, and uh, what are the timing of the various structures. Uh, so thank you, thank you to CIM for uh, letting me uh, present this, and thank you all for listening. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to uh, try and answer them after this, or you can uh, contact me.
various ways there. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, please feel free to ask Simon any questions that you might have. Remember that you can either um, raise your hand and, and ask the question, or you can type into chat. Okay, so if there's no question specifically for Simon, what I'll do is I'll open it up to ask a question now that you, you've heard both presentations for both Simon and Susan. I am seeing one question in the chat. Does extract geophysical structurals manually or automatically? Um, well, um, I, I do it manually. Um, for uh, I've had conversations with uh, my colleagues about potentially um, automatically picking form lines. Um, we do feel that that may be possible. Uh, we're not sure how one how good it will be. Um, but uh, the issue I have with it is that I said initially how I think that the form line interpretation, while it seems like it's the, the simplest part, um, and some people suggest, oh, you're not really doing any interpretation in that in that phase, that you actually are, because you're starting to see things uh, in the rocks, you're starting to see the grain, you're starting to see where breaks are. So I find that um, manual picking uh, of those lines uh, is uh, is really important actually for doing the um, the interpretation of the, the faults and the folds later on. Okay, thank you to Susan and Simon for wonderful presentations today. Up next uh, for part four, we will have a presentations on Thursday, June 24th, between 12 and one. We will have Rob Richard from Galway Medical Metals, who will be speaking with the Clarence Stream project update, as well as Dave Copeland from Magna Terra, who will be speaking on Cape Spencer and Hawkins Love Gold Projects, exploration update and plans for 2021. Thank you for attending, and we look forward to you joining us on June 24th for part four of the CIM New Brunswick branch virtual event series on an emerging gold district in southwestern New Brunswick. Have a wonderful day.